Good morning and welcome back to week three. And we are looking at solutions and suspensions this week in chemistry B. So let's go ahead and take a look at the notes um, to get an overview of solutions. And then in lesson two, you'll be working um, more independently through application with solutions. So if we head on over to the notes um, and look at the solution um, notes, we first of all want to start by understanding what exactly is a solution. A solution is a mixture, and if you remember back to chemistry A, we did talk about mixtures and pure substances at the beginning of chemistry. A mixture, just to remind you, is two or more elements or compounds that are mixed together. They're not bonded, so please keep that in mind. They're just physically mixed or combined together into a container. And if you remember our two types of mixtures, um, solutions are one of those kinds of mixtures that we call homogeneous. So a homogeneous mixture is evenly mixed or distributed with what's called the solute first throughout the solvent. So it looks the same throughout it, or it's evenly mixed. Um, and a solution occurs when something breaks apart into tiny, tiny little pieces, um, and they're mixed together with something else. And in chemistry, solutions are very, very important because most chemistry um, that takes place is done through solutions. So just for example, to give you an idea of all, about solutions and how important they are, the human body has multiple different solutions, blood, salts, sugars, proteins. All of these are examples of solutions and salts and sugars dissolve into water, right? Because our bodies are made up predominantly of water. So these solutes like salt or sugar are able to dissolve in water and create solutions. So a solution is divided into two parts, right? This idea of the solute that we were talking about is the substance that gets dissolved. So that would be salt or sugar in the previous example with our bodies. If we put salt or sugar into water and stir it around and dissolve it, then that substance is called a solute. And solutes have to be dissolved in a solvent. The substance that does the dissolving of the solute is called the solvent. Water is one of the most common of these solvents. Um, sometimes we also use oil or petroleum-based products um, as solvents or cleaners. So here's a question I'd like you to answer yourself and just think in your mind. If we have a glass or a beaker of salt water, which part is which? Which part is the salt and which part is the sugar or the water in this case? Okay, so the salt would be the solute and the water would be the solvent. So, as I mentioned a minute ago, water is a very common solvent, and it's so common that it's called the universal solvent because of its ability to dissolve most anything that it comes into contact with. So, in these examples of these graduated cylinders here, we've got different solutions that are mixed in. And the question is, what's going on with the solute and the solvent within these graduated cylinders, right? So water is our solvent. As the first sample says up here at the top, 
the H2O is the solvent. And then if we go down, copper sulfate is the solute or the substance being dissolved. So we begin to see the process of these mixing, right? The water is acting on the copper sulfate and removing pieces of copper sulfate from the parent crystal here. And we see it ultimately ends up in a solution, right? So we've got a solution here started out as a sample. Notice the top is clear water. So this is with the solid before it's dissolved and then the water acts upon it and is able to dissolve it. Now it becomes a solution where the copper sulfate particles are spread out evenly or in a homogeneous manner to create a solution. So can anything dissolve? Well, some combinations will not mix, right? So like if you've tried to mix oil and water before, you know that those can't mix together because they're not soluble in one another. So the term for that is insoluble, where oil and water are not able to mix together. Copper and hydrochloric acid um, do not form a solution either. Um, they are insoluble, or the copper is insoluble in the hydrochloric acid. Also, zinc and hydrochloric acid is able to dissolve. So this is a yes answer. Okay, so this one would be soluble as it is termed. Sometimes when we mix together two things that do not dissolve, um, they react and make a product that doesn't. Okay, so if we put zinc and hydrochloric acid, that dissolves, right? So that's soluble. Um, they mix two things together like that that do dissolve. Um, in some reactions, not this one with zinc and hydrochloric acid, but in other reactions, um, they can form a precipitate, which is a substance that is not able to dissolve. It's a product that's generated by the chemical reaction that is not able to dissolve in the resulting solution. So that product becomes a solid. If you were to do that with two solutions, the solutions um, would be cloudy. So here's an example of what is a precipitate. If we look at sodium chloride and silver nitrate, both of these are aqueous substances. And when we combine them as aqueous substances together, either in a test tube or in a well plate, we're able to produce two new substances. Okay. Those two new substances are going to result where one of them is insoluble, which is called the precipitate. And if you look at the reaction down here at the bottom of the screen over on the right hand side, on our far right is silver chloride. Silver chloride is a solid substance that is insoluble as a product. So it's called a precipitate. So how can we tell? Um, we have a rule of thumb called like dissolves like, where polar solvents are able to dissolve polar compounds that are the solute, okay? So remember, polar means charge, where we have a separation of positive and negative charge on a given molecule, like in water, for example. Water is polar because we have the separation of charges or electrons creating those, those partial charges of polar um, with negative and positive partial charges. Nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar compounds. So polar dissolves polar, nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. Okay, so like dissolves like. So, what would be some examples of things that will mix, right? Water is polar, as we mentioned a second ago, and vegetable oil is nonpolar, which is why I mentioned a few minutes ago, oil and water, when you combine them, they don't mix or create a solution. The reason for that is they are opposites. They're not like each other, so polar and nonpolar. Alcohol, like rubbing alcohol, is a polar substance, and that would dissolve in water because water is also 
a polar substance. So here's a quick table just to show you um, some of the combinations and what would happen if they dissolve or not dissolve. Um, if we combine water and alcohol, as we mentioned, these would mix or dissolve. Um, and we would say that that's miscible if they mix. Where the alcohol is soluble in water. However, like we mentioned a few minutes ago, water and oil do not mix. Um, so, no, they do not dissolve. And the term for that is immiscible, meaning they do not mix together. They're insoluble. And the same is also true for alcohol, right? You might predict that after knowing from our list up above that alcohol is polar and vegetable oil is nonpolar. So, therefore, those two would not um, mix they would be immiscible or insoluble. So here's some different kinds of solutions, right? We can have um, more things than just a solid dissolved in a liquid, although that's probably our predominant way of thinking about solutions. There are really other types of solutions because if you remember back on our first slide, we said that solutions are two substances, either elements or compounds that are just physically mixed together. So the state does not really matter what the substances are in. We can mix a lot of different states together. So solid and liquid like sugar or salt and water, those would be a solution. The other thing that we just talked about was water and rubbing alcohol being similar because they're both polar, they would be able to mix together and create a liquid in liquid solution. Gases can also mix in liquids like soda or pop down here on the lower right with our Fago example, right? So the carbon dioxide dissolved in the liquid water creates the carbonation or the fizz within soda. Types of solutions continued. There are other types as well. So we've got mothballs, which are solid and gas, right? And liquid and gas can also mix together, like we just looked at. We can use a gas like water vapor, right? Would be an example of that in air. And then air that we breathe is also a mixture. So gas and of oxygen mixes with the nitrogen gas and other gases. That creates a mixture, which is called a solution. We can also have a solid-solid solution. A solid-solid solution is like metals, for example. Metal alloys are quite common. Um, to give desired qualities and characteristics um, of different substances. So metal alloys like steel um, are created from iron, copper, and chromium to make stainless steel. Um, bronze is also another example of a metal or solid solution. And then there are some solids like palladium metal that can absorb hydrogen. So that would be a gas in a solid. So colloids and suspensions are interesting. Um, a suspension is when you have a mixture where the solute or what you put in it as the solid, for example, if you were to put like large salt crystals, um, it would take a lot of stirring. Um, maybe even some heating for those to dissolve. Um, but there are some things that you could put in that just wouldn't dissolve, right? Like um, sand, for example. But they are still mixtures by definition. Um, colloids can have um, particles that are so small they don't sink. They don't dissolve, but they don't sink or settle to the bottom either. Um, so, this is 
an interesting um, phenomenon that we see, um, like fog, for example. And it scatters light, it, right, like car headlights, for example, um, would be scattered or the light beam gets scattered by the fog. Um, they're small enough that we can't see the actual particles in most cases of fog. We can't see the water particles. Um, but we do know that they scatter light, however. So this creates um, what's called the Tyndall effect, um, which allows us to determine if a solution um, is either a colloid or a solution. So it's a determining test that we can do, right? So if we look at these two, we can see that with the solution, the light goes right through both the graduated cylinder on the left here um, by the light source. Um, the solution, the light is able to go right through the solution. Um, and the graduated cylinder to the right of that is scattering the light beam, and you can see it scattering the light beam um, because it's a colloid. So there are also different types of suspensions we can get a little bit more specific and look at liquid particles that are suspended in gases, right? Like water vapor, for example, fog that we've been talking about. Um, clouds or mist are also examples of that. Solids and gases um, can also create an aerosol called a solid aerosol, like smoke, for example, um, is solid pieces, so it does there are also solid pieces that float around through the air or through gas. So types of suspensions, right? So we have whipped cream, mayonnaise, um, paint, um, as examples of suspensions that can be created from different combinations of gases, liquids, and solids. So notice the first one, if our particle is a gas, and we suspend that into a liquid, that's what whipped cream is. So by whipping it, um, it creates kind of this foamy um, texture that we call it. Um, and then also liquids and liquids create what's called an emulsion. So milk, mayonnaise, and lotions are examples of emulsions where a liquid is suspended in another liquid. And then if we suspend solid particles in the liquids, that would be an example of like paint, right? So that's a solution where we would get a paint color with small solid particles dissolved in a liquid. For a suspension, gases can be suspended in solids like foam, like we called um, styrofoam, Aerogels, those are examples of gas getting dissolved into a liquid um, piece. For example, like this one down here in the bottom, showing bottom center with the hand on it. Liquids in solids, um, gels like jello or an opal, like the one pictured on the left, or solids and solids, right? So Solid solution, colored glass, for example, is a solid suspended in another solid. So when we make a solution, we come to the end of what a solution is able to hold due to solvent or solute's ability to dissolve it into the solvent. So you can't add solute to any solvent forever there's a limit and that limit we call saturation so sooner or later you're going to reach the saturation point and the solid is just going to sink to the bottom so if you mix up a glass of salt water you can note that the salt will dissolve even as you stir it for a while but eventually if you keep adding salt 
it's going to stop being able to dissolve and it will reach what's called the saturation point. So we call these saturated solutions because they're maxed out. They can't hold any more. And so it's no longer able to dissolve anything into solution. On the flip side of this, we can also have a solution that's still able to hold more. So if you take a solution, you can test it by trying to add more and see if it'll dissolve. If it will dissolve into it, then it's what's called unsaturated. Okay, so that means it's able to hold more solute. A supersaturated solution um, is for solids dissolved in liquids. It is possible um, to increase the saturation level um, by heating it, right? So if you heat up a pan of water, for example, maybe you're trying to make a nectar solution for hummingbirds and you want to dissolve some sugar into some water. Well, to get it nice and sweet as a nectar solution for hummingbirds, you're going to need to dissolve a lot of sugar into the water. And that's going to require some heat because sugar is not real soluble, especially in larger quantities. So if you dissolve that solid into a hot liquid, you would expect the solid to turn back to a solid. Um, or go back to the way it was. But sometimes the solute will not become a solid again. It will stay dissolved. And that's called supersaturation. So it's more concentrated or holding more solute than it normally would. Like concentrated, like we talked about a minute ago with concentrated solutions. So supersaturated heating it up, dissolving more than it would normally hold, say at room temperature, as a solution. Okay, so that is a quick overview for you um, on solutions. And hopefully you can come back to this if you need to as you're working on your questions this week um, or your activity um, in lesson two and make a reference to these pieces of information on this video if you need to. Also feel free to reach out um, via email or remind if you need help um, with either the questions or the activity this week and I'll look forward to seeing you guys again soon um, in the next lesson.